Welcome to Academy Dialogues. It starts with us. A safe space for honest conversation and authentic thoughts. Our conversation today is owning your brand. Guiding this conversation is Academy Governor, award-winning film and TV producer, best-selling author, Devon Franklin. Joining Devon, producer, Deborah Martin Chase, film producer, digital publisher, and creator of the Hollywood Blacklist, Franklin Leonard, president and managing partner of M88, Bill Sun. On to you, Devon. Hey, hey, what's up, y'all? Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, this is another, you know, edition of Ca Academy Dialogues as an Academy governor. Uh, we are so excited to be a part of this series. It's really about bringing conversations, um, you know, to the forefront that we traditionally don't have. It's all about representation. It's all about inclusion. And one of the ways to get there is to talk and communicate about uncomfortable truths, uh, to talk about where we are and where we need to go, you know, as an industry. So I just want to say what's up. Welcome, uh, Deborah and, and Phil and Franklin. What's up, man? How how y'all doing today? Uh, Deborah, you on mute. Going? We gotta we gotta unmute. We gotta we gotta unmute. The... We gotta unmute. Good to see you guys. Good. To we gotta unmute. We should just put that on a T-shirt right there. <laughs> I feel like that's that's that that's a, a mantra the for the for, for, for going forward. Yeah, some exactly. People gotta mute though. Some people gotta mute. That, that's, that's, that's a very good point. <laughs> I'll go on the other Phil, side of that. That's, a very, that's a very good point. I love it. I love it. So even before we get started, you know, listen, Franklin and Phil, I just want to just note that we, all three of us, are grateful to share the airspace with Deborah Martin Chase on this conversation. Oh, well, I just want to just note it. She is a legend. She is a trailblazer. Uh, you know, if we could do half of what she's done in this business, we will have done a whole lot. So uh, I'm just honored to be here with all of you, but specifically you, uh, Deborah. So thank you. Thank um, you. So I just want to jump in and, and really kind of dive into what I feel uh, is a conversation that we have not had and we are not having. Um, and I really want to talk about finding success outside of the traditional Hollywood system. All of us have uh, done that and are doing that. Um, so I really want to get into the system itself. Uh, is the system working? Is the system failing? What are the changes that can be made in the system? Um, because we talk about this institution of Hollywood, but very few people have had the inside look into the system of Hollywood like the four of us. So, you know, Deborah, why don't we start with you? You know, obviously, you, you for those who may not know, uh, you know, you are a Harvard Law graduate. You are an attorney. Uh, but you also took a turn in your career where you became an intern uh, for the legendary Frank Price, chairman of Columbia Pictures. And so you have an intimate knowledge of the studio system, but you chose to blaze trails as a producer, a content creator. So talk about your experience inside the system and what led you to ultimately make the decision to work outside of it? You know, there are two things. One was that having had a career as an attorney that I, you know, put on the shelf to make movies because I loved movies and it was a passion and it was a dream to do it. You know, getting the glimpse into the system while I was working with Frank and he, he's my first mentor. He was so good to me and gave me, gave me the opportunity as his executive assistant that usually goes to the white guy, frankly. You know, I went with him to his meetings. I sat with him in the office and asked questions. And so I really got a look at what was going on. And I just found, at least at that time, the politics were so heavy. You know, the, it, it wasn't about, he was about filmmaking, but in terms of the rank and file of the executives, it was really about positioning and posturing and fear and, you know, parking spaces. And it really wasn't about the work. Um, but secondly, it's like, you know, particularly once he left, he left and he was kind of ousted in a very big coup, there was no place for me. Like nobody wanted to, it, it, I, I used to say, I felt like the lone Democrat in the Republican White House, you know, as a black woman, nobody really was interested in the things that I was interested in doing. Um, and, you know, as, as will be a theme, I think throughout this conversation, there's diversity and then there's inclusion. And I was not being included. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to the, they weren't inviting me to the dinner parties. I wasn't going to, you know, they weren't building relationships with me. So it, and I'm a, I'm a very, very social person. I have friends all over the world, all from all walks of life, colors, whatever. 
And it just wasn't a welcoming place. And I'm like, I'm not living my life like this. I mean, I want to make movies, but I also want to be appreciated for who I am. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you know, I, I, we're going to unpack the diversity versus inclusion because you are a thousand percent right. And, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons why, uh, you know, as people of color, there has always been a challenge within the Hollywood system because of that word diversity, which is so different than the, the idea behind inclusion. Um, so Franklin, I want to I want to toss to you. You know, Deborah mentions politics. Uh, you were a studio executive for Universal. Um, talk about you know the politics. Talk about the studio system and what you saw there or what your experience was that made you feel or made you decide. You know what, this is maybe not the life for me, and there's something different. Yeah, I mean, I think like like Deborah mentioned, you know, I came into the industry, I think, somewhat naive. I, I wanted to make movies, I wanted to make great movies, and I wanted those movies to make money. And those were my priorities as I thought through the material that came in. I would look at the culture, I would look at audiences, and I would try to, you know, identify material that might work with those. And whenever I would bring material to sort of the conversation or, or perspective to the conversation, I realized that the responses weren't driven by a sort of rational analysis of the argument that I was trying to make. It was driven by, okay, how does this response position me vis-a-vis -vis other people at the company that will allow me to ascend to certain statures? And I, I've never, and I understand the impulse behind that, right? Like people have mortgages, they have kids in private school, they have their own career aspirations and they're trying to secure the bag. And that leads to certain incentive structures that lead to certain behavior. I've just never been good at that. Like I, and, and, I, and I recognize it as something that is, is in some ways like a professional failure of mine. I'm just not good at navigating corporate bureaucracy. I am good at advocacy and I am good at sort of identifying good material and, and getting it to, to, the, to the public. So I realized very early on that I was never gonna thrive in an environment that was driven by that system of rules. Um, and it became very clear to me that if I was gonna be successful in, in this industry or likely any other, frankly, I would have to try to do it my own way. Um, and, and, you know, I left uh, Universal to go to Overbrook to work for Will. Uh, part of that exit was, was them committing to me that I could develop the Blacklist as a for-profit venture simultaneous to working there. So I was working, you know, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. for Will and then 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. for myself. Uh, and two years later, I was able to sort of launch the company literally almost eight years ago today. Um, and, and I had that runway because of, you know, the understanding that I think you know, Will and James Lasseter had too, which is you can't do it alone and you kind of need somebody to say, okay, look, I don't know how this is going to work, but as long as you do right by us, we're going to make it possible to you do right by you and everybody's going to be good. And I'm infinitely thankful to them for that um, because they, they really did set me on my way. Um, and here we are today, you know? Yeah, which is which is great because to that point, you know, having that type of support and, and incubation is is a critical element of, of, I believe, anyone in this business to be successful has to have incubation because this is an apprenticeship business. Uh, it's a very difficult business just to come into without having, you know, learned every aspect of it and having others who have already learned it help us along the way. So, you know, I mean, listen, I share the same uh, level of, of um, great gratitude for Will and James. I mean, I got my start as an intern for them and, and all of that. So without that type of incubation, certainly wouldn't be here today. Um, so, Phil, you know, let's I want to talk and, and just talk about, you know, this idea of, you know, you just recently uh, exited the the system. You were an agent, uh, one of the you know top agents for WME, uh, representing uh, some of the most uh, dynamic and successful talent in the world. But recently, the news of your exit to start uh, in the management division for Macro, uh, you know, shook the industry. You know, I personally was like, "What? Phil's son is gone. What is going on with these places?" I'll be honest with you. So, can we talk about you know? What was going on in the system? Uh, what were the politics or the challenges that you may have faced uh, that ultimately may have led to uh, making the decision to go out on your own and, and start this new incredible uh, endeavor? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a journey to, to where, you know, where we got to with M88. And it's certainly, to, to your point and also to Franklin's point, it's, it's my new venture is not you know, alone. Like Charles King, um, who I partner with at Macro, who has really, you know, built a pathway for many people of color 
um, outside of the system. Um, we stand on his shoulders for sure as we build this new company. But right. um, the system itself and representation, you know, it's it's tricky, right? Because, you know, in representation, you need to learn the system, right? Like in order to advocate for stories of people of color and advocate for your clients fully, you need to understand what is the strength and how they have done it in the past, right? So my journey at the agency was actually, you know, for the 15 years I was there from mailroom to senior partner, you know, it was, it was all a big educational system for me. Right. Um, and like you said, you needed mentors to kind of excel in this business and any sort of system. Right. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, I had a few great mentors, Charles King being one of them, you know, um, Patrick Weitzel, but you know, you need that continued growth in order to continue to grow. Right. So, uh, the, the representation system, if we're talking for real, right, the agencies and the old school representation systems are built to represent a certain type of talent, right? And it's, it's built to operate in kind of an older system across the board with studios, producers, et cetera, right? Like to, to what Deborah was talking about, you can do business with people, but there's a different thing when you're going to dinners with them and going on rafting trips and like having, you know, friendships with them. Right. Um, I think the representation, you know, game is evolving because now the clientele that is being represented and also making money at the box office and putting, you know, butts in seats and eyeballs on, on television screens, they don't look like they did before. Mm -hmm. They're multicultural. They're the, you know, the, the new global majority. Right. So now, the system is doing its best to try to catch up to having representatives that also look like the talent that is on screen. And where we're playing a little bit from behind is that's not something you can react to and fix. That's a pipeline, right? That's like, that's, that's actually uh, putting efforts in years prior to like, it took me 15, 15 years to get to where I am. Right. And that's me. I'm, I'm unique, right? And now when I look down and, and see the new future of the agency where I left, it gives me great joy to see people who look like me, look like the, the, the world looks, right? But there's such a long way to go. And because the system is built in a certain way, I felt that, and also, as you know, agency wars, like if you do something good for diversity and inclusion at one agency, you hope it would spread but it can be taken as like, oh, this is a WME thing or, oh, this is a CAA thing, whether it's Amplify, whether it's Power. Like, right. that, we, we kind of put a ceiling on ourselves as far as how, how we can move. And so all that to be said, it led me to a decision of partnering with Charles King, who was a longtime mentor of mine with the support of my agency um, and becoming a third party becoming, you know, a manager where we can push the envelope. We're building a representation firm now that not only represents the global majority, but is built within from the global majority. The point of view of, you know, diversity at agencies is usually an afterthought. It's a program, you know, it's, it's a reaction to the times of what's going on in the world. This representation firm is built from the core of those beliefs from the onset. Mm. There is no afterthought right? There is no reaction. It is just us, right? And in a world that's chasing culture, yeah, I think all of us are, you know, have seen the studios and, and the buyers chasing, like, what is a culture? Who is a culture mover, right? right? We're trying to bring culture within one institution, right? Sure. Instead, of, instead of kind of having everyone spread out, we now have a home. If you choose and want to come, it's here for you. Um, and so that's, it's a it's a complicated world the representation world because i think it's the least the, it's the it's the silo of the industry that's least spoken about right because there's always a negative connotation to reps to suits um to you know the whatever you know label you want to put on it it's not often positive mm -hmm. right and we we as a community need to address that as well because quite frankly the agencies, the big ones especially, they're, mark, they're perfect marketing machines. They understand how to make someone great, right? But, but we have to understand how to utilize that in our way, 
right? right? And how to work with them mm -hmm. and push them to market in our way. Um, and hopefully that's what MA88 will help, you know, specifically the big agencies do. Right. And for those of you that are watching, M88 is the new uh, company, uh, the joint venture that that uh, Phil has Phil Sun has started with Charles King and Macro. I, I want to ask a, a, a provocative, potentially provocative question, just to, to to all of you. Do they not like us? When you talk about all of us have, you know, I was as as you all may know, I was an executive at uh, Columbia Pictures for ten years and worked my way up from director of development all the way to senior vice president, but. You know, uh, talking, going back to Deborah, you know, there weren't invitations to hang out and do the social things or be a part of the social, you know, crowd, so to speak. You know, it was just working within the system and doing my best. But I just want to ask that question. Is it that, that they just don't like us, you know? Is, is the system racist? Is the system prejudiced? You know, let's just ask the honest question. What, what is it? You know, so whoever wants to just jump in on that. Okay. I, I think it's twofold. Okay. I think one, and this is something that people really don't talk about. LA is one of the most racially segregated cities in America, right? I mean, I'm, you know, the, the West side is kind of all white, you know, the, the East side of town is more integrated, but you have, so as a practical matter, you have, and you know, it's not like, cause I also live in New York, you know, pre COVID, Everybody took the subway, you know, everybody walked down the street. So just on a daily basis, you would interact with people, you know, that didn't look like you. And it's just, it, it's, just it's just a different makeup. So, you know, you have people that just in their, in their real lives don't know any people of color, except for perhaps, honestly, you know, people who, you know, the nanny or the gardener or, you know, somebody who they are not, that, that they do not consider an equal. So hmm. there's like, there's not a comfort level, you know, hmm. there's this kind of natural, like, okay, you're black, I'm white, like with people, like that kind of, so I, I think that that's one. And then secondly, it isn't until recently, and we can all chart the, how it happened, that Hollywood finally recognized that diversity is good business. You know, for years, we were saying that, we were saying, guys, the world does not look like the west side of Los Angeles. And they were still saying, you know what, but mm, I don't know, like a black lead in an hour long drama, I don't know that white people are gonna tune in because they weren't talking to people that didn't think like they did. So I think once Hollywood realized, so therefore there was no incentive to, change, to reach out, to change lifestyle, to expand your, you know, comfort level vision. So Phil, you were kind of alluding to this once Hollywood said, oh, this is money. Mm -hmm. These stars are money. You know, it's not The Rock is the biggest star, in, you know, one of the biggest stars in the world, rock, The Rock, Vin Diesel. You know, you start going down the list of the sure enough money makers now, you know, most of them are. So it changed. It's like, okay, well, we need to know people. We need to begin to, you know, be familiar with these people. They need to like us because we need them. And so it started to open things up, but I still find, you know, I just, I don't know, this is, you know, but what I'm, cause I, again, I spent a lot of time in New York and I'm on some, the board of the New York City Ballet and Second Stage Theater and blah, blah, blah. You know, when I walk in a room there and people don't know me, they're like, oh, She's in the room. She must be interesting. Let me make a point to get to know her. Hmm. Here, you go in a room and they see a black woman that's not Beyonce or Hallie or somebody that they that people think, oh, you know, it's important. They assume you're not important. They assume they don't need to know you. And okay. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a room and somebody will overhear my name because you know we do so much on the phone pre-COVID, you know, pre-Zoom. And people are like, oh my God, Deborah, it's you. I didn't recognize you. And it's a whole different attitude. Wow. You know, so yeah. Got I it. would actually challenge the idea that, that people have figured out that it's good business. Um, I think we're getting there. I think they're starting to realize that, but I don't think that they still think of black actors, women, 
black women, Latinx actors, Asian actors as being financially equivalent to their white peers in pure economic terms. And, and, and I say that for two reasons. One, the economic argument has always been there. Eddie Murphy was big in the 80s. Denzel Washington right. was big in the 90s. Will Smith was big in the 2000s. They were always, we have always been amongst the biggest movie stars on earth, even mm -hmm. internationally. Right. Even internationally. And so, and I remember going into studio meetings and saying, hey, why don't you make more black movies? And the answer was always, well, we'd love to, but we can't sell those abroad. People don't want to oh, see yeah. black oh, yeah. faces on screen. And, and here's the thing, that was and continues to be a lie. That, it, that requires that you believe that for all of the last 40 years, while hip hop was the most powerful cultural force around right. the world, right. and people were going to concerts the world over, while people were cheering for black athletes, while people were paying to see coming to America in Germany in the mid 1980s, somehow other black actors weren't viable, which just was, pure, was not true period. And the numbers have been run by Stacey Smith at USC that have proven statistically that there is no difference in the international box office of diverse content when it is supported by marketing dollars that the, that the studios traditionally have not spent. That's right. And I would say beyond that, there is also a gross undervaluation of people not in front of the camera. When a young black woman walks into an agent's office and says, I'm a director, they don't think to themselves, I'm talking to the next Steven Spielberg. They don't think I'm talking to the next James Cameron. Interesting. And as a consequence of that, when Ava DuVernay wins the Best Director Award at Sundance, she yep. gets no studio meetings off the back of that. None, not one. And you can ask her about that, right? Um, where, whereas if you are Colin Trevorrow, Oh, and you win the Best Director Award at Sundance for Safety Not Guaranteed, your next movie is a Jurassic Park sequel, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and again, it comes from a gross undervaluation of people of color, of women, of all of these things. And the reality is, is like, we need to put a very fine point on it. That is racism. That is sexism. And it's perpetuated by a system that allows people to think that they're justifying it because they're saying, oh, well, if you look at the numbers, these people have less value. I challenge anybody who makes that claim, show me the numbers, give me your receipts. I'll become your best advocate. I've been saying this for 15 years and no one has presented those numbers. Let me tell you one thing and Phil, I know you want to jump in just- Oh, go ahead. What, what happened with Eddie, Denzel and Will, people said, well, they're white. I mean, they're black, but people think that they don't, people don't think of them as being black. <laughs> so they were able to, they, so they took them out of the equation. Exactly. Right? Which, which, you know, I mean, that's what racism does. It's like, you can't see the truth for the truth. Well, when you can't be, you try to embrace it, right? When you can't be, you try to embrace it. And also here's what ultimately this all comes down to. Your question was, in my personal opinion, I don't think the industry is inherently racist, right? I think it's, as I've said before, older systems, but here's the deal, right? All these decisions, all of these movies that are being made, content being made, people being elevated, it all comes down to who's present in the smallest of rooms of decision makers, right? Mm -hmm. and, and until until that changes, you're, you're right. lacking a point of view when the smallest room is created, when the decisions are made to fight for the things that we all as a collective already know, right? Is that when Moonlight's successful, when Black Panther's successful, when Crazy Rich Asians is successful, when Tiger Tail, you know, gets rave reviews and so, it's not a surprise, it works. It has worked over and over, but because it's so spaced out, because there's still barriers to entry, everything seems like an anomaly, right? But you don't, you don't see that with traditionally white content, like, because it's so overwhelming, it's, in, it's normal, right? If you yeah. normalize, you know, then maybe these arguments that are foolish stop right but it all it all goes to the top right we you know when there are people of color or allies or women up top making decisions there will be different results mm, good, good ex excellent point uh you know it reminded me you know um deborah what you were just saying it reminded me of that uh, you know that iconic scene in do the right thing uh when mookie's having the conversation um at the pizza shop you know, and there's some, you know, black faces and they're like, oh, well, no, those aren't. 
You know what I mean? Like, no, you know, and it's like this idea that just because a person of color, a black man, black woman, you know, uh, so on and so forth becomes successful at that level. Oh, they've transcended race. It is it is the most fundamental lie that is perpetuated in our business. And then, Franklin, I want to touch on something you said, which which was, you know, very profound. I mean, listen, I know. Y'all know me as a preacher. I don't know, Franklin, man. You you got a preacher in you, man. <laughs> You're quite an evangelist, my it's brother. Name, I'm just going to tell you. It, it, it comes from the Franklin thing. That, that's <laughs> that's thing right. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Because what you said, which was which is so true, is this idea of value, right? Just because the color of our skin is different, does that mean we are less valuable? And when you think about how Hollywood has perpetuated that lie, that goes back to the days of slavery, when we as black people weren't even considered a full person. So this is why we have to continue to, to literally have this conversation so that, that the power structure and those that are in position can hear this. And, and when you really hear it played back, it sounds ludicrous. Well, no, of course. Just because you have a different color or you're a different gender, that doesn't make you less valuable. But when you run the PL, when you talk about who you can put movies together with, their answer is, oh, well, they don't travel. Well, why don't they right. travel? Because they aren't supported. Never, they aren't given the opportunity. Because you never marketed them. Exactly. Right. That's absolutely I mean, right. You know, Beyonce is the biggest, you know, music star in the world. On earth. On earth. So, you know, and I remember being in Kathmandu, Nepal years ago and watching this kid walk down the street with his pants hanging down. He had an old boom box playing hip hop. And I'm like, that, it's like how, we, we, def, we drive culture around the world. How are movies not being, not being received? And also, can I, mean, I, look, I, 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 I go ahead. I was gonna say two things. There, there are two moments for me that really crystallized where Hollywood misses it on race, and particularly as it applies to, to Black folks. One was actually relatively early in my career. I remember, I think it might have been Ride Along, and mm -hmm. um, you know, every every Friday night, every Friday before you know the movies come out, there are all of these organizations that will try to forecast the box office, right? And they forecasted the box office for Ride Along. The, the predictions were somewhere in the low twenties, I think, or like high teens. And I remember tweeting like. It's a black movie, take the over. Always take the over on black movies because they will always underestimate us. And sure enough, the movie came out, I think right along open to like mid thirties or something. And one of those organizations tweeted, you know, who could have foreseen that ride along was gonna do so well? And I responded, I was like, well, here's my receipt that I did. I always said, take the over. And I was like, and by the way, you should know that if you look back at your last 10 black movies, you've been mm -hmm. under every single time. And that may say something. And their response was like, but why do you have to make it about race? And I was like, listen, it is about race. One, that's why I made it about race. But two, I'm actually less offended as a black man than I am as a math nerd because your model is clearly wrong. And if you underestimate something consistently, you should probably fix your model. Now, mm -hmm. that's sort of fun from a math nerd, like gotcha thing, but it goes to the core of another issue, which is, the studios themselves are using the same formulas and algorithms to predict the box office when they greenlight those movies. And if right. they assume that they're going to make less money than they are, they're less likely to make those movies. They're less likely to give them the financial support from a budget perspective and from a marketing perspective. And you end up with a circular process that results in less success. And exactly. it is remarkable and a testament to the work that, that Black folks and frankly, all kinds of diverse folks in this business are doing, whether they be gay, whether they be Asian, whether they be Latinx, that they continue to overperform despite the lack of resources. It goes to show just how much talent is there and just how much money there is being left on the table by not giving them the budgets they deserve and not giving them the marketing support they deserve. Very quickly, the second thing was, I was in Shanghai two years ago. And I think we all know that one of the reasons that Hollywood specifically gives about racism uh, and black folks on screen is, well, we'd love to make more black movies, but it's really hard to sell those movies in China specifically. And it's a huge market and it's really important that we sell, uh, that, we, that we successful there. And I was walking back to my hotel one night in Shanghai and in gi a giant billboard above the uh, Tomorrow Square Marriott uh, was a, a billboard for the new Apple iPhone with a dark-skinned black woman on the billboard. Now, 
Apple clearly thinks they can sell iPhones in China with black faces. And somehow Hollywood doesn't think they can sell black faces in movies. If I had to choose between who's done a more consistent job of selling their products effectively around the world, I'm picking Apple every time. Yeah. And the, the core of that is, it's not just racist to say, oh, we can't sell black people abroad. It's specifically saying, no, we can't sell black people abroad because the Chinese are more racist than we are. It's actually a double racism because you're characterizing not only black folks and their value around the world, but also Chinese people and the Chinese community as somehow worse than the Westerners that created anti-blackness in the first place. Yeah, it's the deflect game. It's absolutely the deflect game. Yeah. Wow. I mean, Which is why, for me, all of us got to get together. Because if, if all of us aren't at the party, mm -hmm. it's not a good party. Like, yeah. I'm interested in a culture that has everybody represented. I want the Asian community there. I want the Black community there. I want the Latinx community there. I want the LGBTQ community there. I want the Middle Eastern community there. I want women there. The food's going to be better. The music's going to be better. The dance floor is going to be lit, and we're all going to have a great time. world we live yes. in. Absolutely. I mean, if movies, if the, you know, I mean, listen, we all, we love movies. You know, that's why we're, we're here and we've worked so hard. But the, the movies are, are to represent what's going on in society, in the world, you know, at a given time. And if we're not capturing the, 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 the globalization, the multicultural, you know, thing that's going on right now, then we're we're just serving the art of of, of our of cinema. You know, and I mean, it's interesting. TV has had a different trajectory, and in some ways, TV has kind of led this this current you know phase of. And I don't think it's a phase. I think it's a turn. I do think it's a turn um, to embrace diversity. And you know, Phil, you made the point of. You know, you have to have, it goes with the decision makers. Well, there was a moment in time that really didn't get publicized much where the head of drama at every major network was black. Hmm. You know, it was Channing, it was yeah. Terrence Carter, uh, it was uh, my girl Perlina. And okay. that's when, you know, sc scandal, you know, scandal, they didn't want to cast black. Right, mm -hmm. but you had Shonda coming off of Grey's Anatomy with some Jews. You had Channing as head of drama, and you had the fact that the character was based on Judy Smith, a black woman. Right, and so right. people knew that they would get killed, you know, if they cast her white. So it was with trepidation that the decision was made to cast Kerry Washington. Then you know, boom. Rest then is Viola, boom, and then Lee Daniels with Empire took it over the top. You know highest rated debut in a decade, blah, blah, blah. And that helped the rest of the industry say, oh, wait a minute. I think that's right. I think also on top of all of that, right, going back to what Franklin just said before about, you know, uh, traveling abroad, right? And, and it, it works if you market it correctly. I think that not only decision-making processes of, of content, but marketing dollars and marketing. Who's, who's marketing, who's making decisions on marketing, mm -hmm. right? We're seeing such a trend now of black artists, Asian artists, you know, whomever, whatever talent, right? Multicultural talent, having their own marketing firms. Yeah. Why? It's because they're not being listened to at the studio level. They only know how to market their the way that they traditionally have marketed and that's not speaking to the audience that the artist is actually trying to speak to and it's not speaking to the audience in the way the content is trying to speak to them right and so you can't market uh you know ride along necessarily with a white lens right and expect it right. to land in the community you, it, that, that doesn't work and all, it sets it up for failure right so like all these pieces that are again in a perfectly formed machine right just need to evolve to be used in the way that reflects the world today right mm -hmm. and it will work but until we make those decision makers you know reflect more of what the world looks like we're going to be at a deficit mm -hmm. so so speaking of uh, oh go ahead frank one, one thing that does excite me about that phil is that like at the end of the day given the way the world is working and given technology and and one upside of the pandemic to the extent that we can talk about that is is that because of the rapid change, those folks who do lead those companies who fail to understand where things are going 
they have really two options. One is to do nothing, continue to do what they do and run their companies into the ground or find somebody who does understand the culture sure. as it exists now and then have a chance of success. And so in many ways, it is the shareholders, it is, it is the, the boards of these companies who need to look around at the people who are running these things and say, is this the best person to take us through this moment? Mm -hmm. And if they're not, you have a fiduciary obligation to your company and to your shareholders to remove them and replace them with someone who does. Sure. Um, and, and, and you know, and that's just the like that's not that's just the way it is. Right. Devon, can I can I piggyback on that for a second? Of course, that's absolutely right. And I I also want to turn it on us a little bit as a community, right? When those executives or you know our friends get those positions, we have to back them as a unified yeah. group, right? Yeah. There is not one seat at the table anymore. Build your own table. They will come. Trust me, it's cooler there. It's, it's just the culture is there, right? Like you just, we have to have that together mentality because the truth is any, any cultural group is not strong enough to stand up to the majority, singularly. Mm -hmm. They're just not, right? The, the whole reason I paired up with Charles other than his, my mentor is time to kind of to send a message to like, yes, you know, I had opportunities elsewhere to be probably ultimately the token, right? or I can link arms with my mentor mm -hmm. and be stronger together, Love right? That. To stand on the shoulders of what he's already built and to continue to rise and pull everyone with us. Like, I think one of the coolest things, you know, Teresa Kang and myself, you know, you, we were represented Lena Waithe together when we were at WME and we brought her to Crazy Rich Asians, right? And she, she posted about Crazy Rich Asians. And that's a, at the time you're like, the Asian community is like, wow, thanks, right? Oh, that's, that's incredible, right? But on the flip side, there's also some community members who are like, why, you know, why are you, you know, supporting them? They don't support us. We have to build that bridge and be involved, okay? Because if I'm standing by Deb, Devon, and Franklin, they can't say it's a Chinese thing, right? right? They can't, they can't pigeonhole me, right? right. And if anyone's standing by Dev, right, of us three, they can't just say it's a powerful woman thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Because I'm there. That's right. You're there. Right. Absolutely. Start, you got to play a little bit of offense through defense. Like, where are they going to poke the holes? Cover up. Well, it's the oldest. I mean, look, well, I don't want to get into politics, but, you know, divide and conquer is yeah. one of the oldest strategies in the book. Right. And, uh, and, and we got to take control. You're absolutely right, Phil. 1,000%. Percent um, on on that part. I, I, I mean, we've acknowledged we're acknowledging you know the challenges in the industry and the truth of the industry uh, in a way that I, I believe anyone watching this conversation uh, will be riveted by it and their their mind will be expanded and I think it will also produce I'm hoping uh, more of a desire to create change. I want to talk about something because um, we don't talk about a lot, but I know that each one of us has had to deal with it. Uh, frustration. You know, when, when we acknowledge the reality of the systems that we all uh, have to deal with in order to, you know, further our business, live our dreams, uh, I just want each one of you just to take a moment. How do you deal with frustration? How do you not, you know, just say, forget it, I'm done, I can't do it anymore, I'm tired. How do you handle frustration? Uh, Franklin, I want to start with you, and then we'll go to Deb, and then we'll go to Phil. Uh, most recently, I've been running a lot. Uh, I find it very difficult to focus on my frustrations when I'm struggling to breathe. So that's very helpful. You're very, um, You're very slender. But, uh, you know, the pandemic's been good for me in that regard too. But, um, no, I, look, I think for me, it, it comes down to remembering how lucky I am that these are my frustrations. Um, and that there are folks who, you know, look, I, my grandfather never finished the fifth grade in West Central Georgia. His father was born a slave in West Central Georgia. And so when I think about the frustrations that I have trying to navigate the film business, knowing that I have a roof over my head and I can afford a nice meal, um, it, gets, it, becomes very, it becomes a lot more difficult for me to be overcome by the frustrations that I have because I can look in the mirror and say, yeah, this is really frustrating and it is really difficult, but people that have come before me have dealt with worse under more adverse circumstances 
And I will be damned if I let less than they had to endure prevent me from trying to accomplish what, what they did, right? Because I'm already standing on their shoulders. I can at least match their work. And, and it, it helps. It doesn't remove the frustration, but it definitely increases my capacity to deal with it. Um, and I think it's a debt that I owe everyone that came before me to try to endure and find ways to cope. But I also think it's really important, and this is a self-care thing. Like I, I, was, I made a joke about the running, but it's true. Sometimes you just have to pull the thing out of the socket for a minute, right? And like go for a run, eat some unhealthy food, watch like, you know, an old Richard Pryor special and just like allow your brain to not feel the anxiety and the stress and the frustration because, you know, get a good night's sleep and wake up the next morning ready to fight again because you can't win every, you don't win every game, right? Like if I played any sport, there are going to be days when you, you get taken to town and you go back to the locker room and you're like, man, forget it. I'm not, I shouldn't be even playing this game, but you know, there's another game on the schedule and you wake up and you keep playing the schedule. And the hope is, is that you win more than you lose and, a bit, and you make the playoffs and you have a chance to take it to game seven. And it's, 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 a, like a, it's a cliche metaphor, but I think it's really true. You can't take yourself too seriously and you can't think that anything's apocalyptic because for, the, for all the seriousness of the work that we do, and it is serious, it's not life or death in the short term. Mm -hmm. And so if you can take a long enough, like a look at a long enough sort of timeline, we all should be able to win. And I, I call Phil, I email you, Devon, I run into Deb and, and you tell me that like, you know, it's going to be okay. And that makes it easier. Love that. Deborah. You know, when, when I was growing up, I never saw people on screen who look like me. And I was a kid that grew up with film and television. My dad was a huge movie buff. And so I got into this business to change that, to change the images on screen, to change the, the narrative, if you will, about women and women of color and people of color. So I had a higher mission. I also, you know, I was a lawyer, I practiced law. So I wasn't defined by the business. And I, and so I realized that I just kept moving forward. I let stuff, I would, you know, deflect things that happened. I would, you know, because I'm like, you know, I'm on a mission, that's your problem. You know, I mean, I was back in the days where literally I would walk into a meeting and the guy would ask me to go get coffee, right? I mean, those were those days because he just assumed, he just, you know, black woman, she could, she had to be, She'd be lucky to be an assistant, you know, at a studio, much less an executive. And and I, but I, what I realized is that I internalized a lot of that, right? Because it do, it it doesn't go just go away. You just suck it up. You just put it down and say, look, I got a high, I got a higher purpose here, you know. And you know, when I became like the first black woman to have a producing deal at a studio, you know that was was really important to me I mean not in and of itself but just because of, of you know it was a sign for me that the, the mission was 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 working but I have to tell you a few years ago I was ready to quit mm. I just it was that period of time where Hollywood was not even thinking about making movies about women or people of color and obviously I've done a little bit of everything but that's my sweet spot I mean that's the mission that I started with. And that was a real you know, motivation for me. And I would go into people's offices and their eyes would glaze over, you know, they just weren't interested. And, and then, I, then you start throwing stuff up against the wall that doesn't really mean anything to you in here, which is where I, I live as a filmmaker. And it wasn't sticking because, you, you know, I, you know, this wasn't, you know, and I, and honestly, I said to myself, I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe I'm done. Maybe I have, you know, served my purpose. And, you know, I started looking at maybe I take this and, you know, go to Wall Street or so I, I started looking around because I was like, I don't want to live, for, you know, I don't want to live like this, not feeling fulfilled and satisfied. And, and then honestly, Harriet, which took me six years, but started, you know, started gaining momentum. And I, in, in doing Harriet, I remembered why I wanted to make movies. Nice. 
And, and thank God, I just lasted to the tie change. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, because we still have a long way to go, but this is the best that it's been in terms of recognizing the value of Black product and talent that since I've been in the business, you know, and in a real way and not black, just, you know, multicultural talent. I mean, you know, from crazy rich Asians to, you know, Black Panther and whatever. Yeah. So I'm happy I stayed. I'm happy I stayed, you know, I'm, so are um, we. we're all benefiting. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm happy you're, you stayed too, Deborah. <laughs> I don't know if I could have handled you leaving either. Lord have that mercy. Been a hey, rough day. Sure. I don't know, Thank I don't you. know. We need us could have dealt with that. I had, I had one foot way out of the door. Wow, back, wow. Man. But it's a well, blessing that back, it was, yeah. that you yeah. saw that you had to be here and you persevered and, and you know, obviously Harriet was, was amazing and all the things you're doing in film and television are incredible. Um, I know our time is getting short, but Phil, I want you just to touch on this, you know, quickly, if you could. Uh, how do you handle frustration? Um, I, I piggyback a bit on, on Franklin, definitely exercise. Uh, um, uh, but it comes down to, it, my life changed nine months ago when I had my son. Um, you know, it just, as you, you know, as you're become a parent, like you realize that it's not about you and it's about legacy and it's about, you know, making sure like he's half Chinese, half Jewish. Um, you know, uh, if he grows up anything like me, uh, in the environments that I grew up in, he'll be seen as different, right. He'll be treated as such. Um, and that doesn't sit well with me. So, you know, it's, it's more of a, how am I going to change? How am I going to do my part to change this world, this industry, this world, um, so that he feels like he belongs because he does. Um, and more, and alongside of that is, you know, the future of the industry. If I get frustrated and I quit, then it's not going to get any better for the Asian kid, black kid, you know, woman who's coming up the ranks if they can't look up and see someone did it. So, you know, Franklin and I have had this conversation before. Maybe it's our, you know, maybe it's our duty in our lifetime to take this on and push the ball forward. And yeah, and Deb certainly has done it, right, for all of us. And right. we will continue to push it. But the alternative is not acceptable to me, which is quitting, mm -hmm. right? The alternative is to not it, to allow the system to beat me, which is it's not going to happen, right? And then I look at my son, my family, and then the future generation of executives, you know, specifically in representation for me. Mm -hmm. yep. And there is no quit because you got to you got to make sure that they can stand on our shoulders and keep going. Mm, Juan, you should answer that question. Yeah. Oh, yes. wow. OK. You, I'll, you, I'll, you know, all, with all that you've accomplished, you're a governor of the Motion Picture Academy. You know, they, we weren't even getting in the door a few years ago to be wow. a member. Well, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. This is why you are who you are. This is <laughs> um, I'll answer briefly as, and tie it into to our wrap up. You know, I mean, I, I deal with frustration. My antidote for frustration is faith. Um, you know, I mean, there have been times, you know, I've been, when I was an executive, man, I'd be in my office crying because I'm like, there's gotta be more. Like, I don't understand. Like I'm, I'm, I'm playing by the rules, but I'm, but I'm not, the score is different and I don't understand. I don't know what's going on. I have these dreams. I have these hopes. I'm getting in early. I'm staying late, but where's the progress? And so, you know, in those darkest moments when I'm, um, and, and because we care so much, right? I know I'm not, you know, I'm not exclusive to, in that regard. We internalize. So when things aren't necessarily going right for us in this business, things aren't necessarily going right for us personally. And so for me, I would internalize and I've learned to separate the two. But at the time, especially when I was the most frustrated, I was tethering the two. My value with my progress in the business. And, and I was not, I was looking in the mirror and not liking who looked back at me questioning, wondering, doubting, uh, being insecure. And so I had to have faith, you know? I had, to, I had to say, okay, I know God has given me a vision. I have to rely on that vision. The same way we go to the movie theater and we see the trailer for a movie that we want to see. I had to keep closing my eyes and seeing the trailer of the movie of my life play on the screen of my mind. And that honestly is what has helped me navigate frustration. Because I just got, I go on the inside. I listen and I see and I say, oh, okay, I can see that. 
And that gives me enough energy and strength to get back up and fight and, and get back in the game and, and have conversations and push and press. Uh, and and to, to Phil's point, not quit. And so that that's how I've dealt with frustration and that's how I continue to deal with it. Uh, you know, through faith. And, and speaking of faith, you know, for those of you that have been watching this Academy, you know, dialogues, I, I really think this should really be called Game Changers because every person on here is a game changer. Uh, I just want to highlight, you know, when you look at Franklin Leonard, there was the blacklist, there was no one who had done the blacklist before. I mean, here he is, you know, as an executive for Will and James Lasseter and had this idea, why don't I get some of my friends to rate the scripts they've been reading? And out of that one idea, the industry changed. Deborah Martin Chase, you know, came to Hollywood from Harvard Law, has blazed the trail not only for women but for people of color in making the biggest movies and now television shows the industry has ever seen. But there was a moment, as she mentioned, she wanted to quit. But she said, I've got to keep going. And as a result, others can look to her and see that it's possible. Phil Sun, just moments ago, was in working for one of the biggest agencies in Hollywood. But something in him said, there's more. And he took the risk of stepping out and starting M88 and now changing the game. If you are watching this, the game can be changed. That is the takeaway. The system needs changing. It can be changed. And the only way to get it done is for us to have the will. I've said it before and I'll say it again. President uh, John F. Kennedy, when he was trying, he was in the space race and he was trying to get to the moon. How do we do it? His chief engineer said, all we have to do is have the will to do it. I challenge you, if you're listening to this conversation, have the will to make change wherever you may be and wherever you may sit. You've been watching Academy Dialogues. Thank you so much for tuning in. And make sure you stay tuned because there's a whole lot more of these conversations coming to you.